couple of you haven't been out to the church on the beach. They have. But uh, I mentioned this in class yesterday, and I wanted to show you what it is. When I said that the Lord would come back, and uh, we talked about the, uh, the name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a talit. This is what it looks like. It's a prayer shawl. And then what, when they pray, they, you know, they walk around like this. Now, you'll see the Jewish people nowadays, and they got all these things hanging out of their pants. I don't know if you've ever seen that. That's because for years and years, they were not allowed to wear any Jew Jewish adornments or any prayer shawls. Okay, so what they do is they would hide it in their clothes and then have this part hanging out to identify them as Jews. And so that's become a practice among the Hasidic Jews. But anyway, this is prayer shawl. And then at the end of the shawl are the tzitzit which is, as I said, this is where the weaving would be. Every weaving would be according to the family. And so they would, it would be a, a signature, basically, that they could press into the mud and say, this is a unique uh, knot that nobody else would have. So when you're wearing this, if you're on a horse, you can see quite clearly where it's going to hang is right on your thigh. So that is the indication of uh, when it says he returns and written on his thigh, is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This thing's just hanging over him when he's on a horse. So that would that is the most likely analysis of that particular passage. But I didn't know if you could get a, a, a sense of that from the uh, from what we were saying yesterday. Anyway, that's that's just one of those kind of interesting things is that about our. To touch the ground with that? Oh no. Okay. Yeah, I hope not because if it is, then uh, I'm in big trouble right now. Yeah, baby. Anyway, there you go. That's a. The what? What a book, huh? Man, oh man. What a book. Yeah, you read that. and uh, The thing about Jude, and you probably don't know this before we get into wherever we were. Um, the thing about Jude is if you look side by side, is it 1 Peter or 2 Peter? 2 Peter, I think. Side by side. It is almost word for word with Jude. It's just that Peter's got more information. He's got three or four chapters. But if you take out the stuff around these verses, they're almost identical. And so Jude is, that's why he says, let's, let me turn there and I'll, I'll, I'll show you what he says at the beginning. Let me put on my glasses. What? I had to read Jude after watching the reporting on the demonstration. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely right. Let's see, Jude says in his book at the beginning, he says, um, uh, Beloved, I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation. I was going to write him a nice epistle about how the Lord saved us all. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to all the saints. So he's basically saying, I'm repeating what has been said before, the faith delivered to the saints. And if you look at, as I said, I think it's uh, 2 Peter, and you take the same words that he says. Men have crept in with condemnation. He speaks about the, uh, you know, the Lord having saved the people out of Egypt and then utter darkness, chains, and the judgment day. And you go through, is it 2 Peter? I think it's 2 Peter. And he says the same concepts. And if you put them side by side, it's almost like a mirror. It's unbelievable. But he just simply shortens it up. So uh, it's a good thing about uh, Jude is it's just simply confirming the word that has already been given by Peter and other spots as well. But Peter talks about the, the uh, pleasure to carouse in the daytime, their spot, spots and blemishes. Um, he says that he talks about Noah, one of eight people, of righteousness, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says the same thing here. He's got uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. He's got the, uh, where does he say, these are spots in your love feast. With, so you can see. Concept after concept is just mirroring it. Very well thought out to put Jude where it is. Anyway, um, I don't remember where we were. Exodus chapter uh, 12. 12. All right, we'll get started here in prayer and, and uh, 1241. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for this beautiful, beautiful morning after a couple days of really appreciated rain. And uh, Lord, a special prayer of thanks for the people of Oklahoma and Texas who got some rain. They are just all so delighted at what you gave them. And I ask that you just continue to bless them with that. Whether they deserve it or not is irrelevant. I just pray for these people that have been suffering so much in the past couple months. And Lord, we thank you for the goodness you do display in our lives and how you've taken good care of us in the state of Florida and uh, given us just enough rain throughout the summer. And uh, now we're getting the cool weather and what a loving God to give us the seasons to, uh, to bless our souls throughout the year. Thank you. Help us to uh, open your word, handle your word properly, handle your word correctly, and that you will be glorified 
through our discussion today. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're probably going to leave a little bit early today because i got to go over to the office. And so uh, maybe about 11, we'll, we'll close up a little early. But um, uh, 12, 12, 1? 41. 12.41. Okay. Anybody there? Go ahead. We'll, we'll see what we can find in here. Oh, yeah. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day, it came to pass that all the enemies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Armies of the Lord, not the enemies of the Lord. <laughs> okay, so remember what we talked about last week, and I've, I've said this several times. At the end of 430 years on that very same day, and Paul makes a point of telling us in the New Testament that 430-year period is not the time in Egypt. It is the time from the covenant with Abraham, okay? The time in Egypt was not 430 years, and that's made clear by all of the uh, ages of the people, the generations that went in, the generations that came out, etc. It's 430 years from the covenant with Abraham. That's Galatians 3. Is that right? Anyway, so just so you're aware of that, and uh, then the uh, armies of the land came out. And uh, I don't think that's the word. No, it's not. But uh, we'll get to it here in uh, uh, a couple, uh, couple passages. Mine well, says divisions. Of the divisions, land. yeah. You know, and I, 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 that's the, I don't think that that is what I'm looking for. But it may be. Oh, no. It's over in uh, verse 18 of 13. We'll be there today, I think. Okay, go ahead. Um, verse 42. It was a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generation. And they have not failed in that. If they failed in a billion other ways, they have not failed in celebrating and observing the Passover. Very careful to do that. And, uh, of course, has anybody, I, I know they did a Passover here with Seth last year. Yeah. Has anybody been to a Jewish family and seen it or actually seen what's called, I think it's called the Halakha, where they, they actually have it all written out and they read every passage. She's been the one. Read every passage. Everything is worded out very carefully. Of course, there are traditions that are added in there. But it's all based on this account right here. And it's something that Jewish people have been doing faithfully. Now, it's, I believe, I, I, I could be wrong on this, but I believe it is the oldest continual celebration of its kind on earth. It is the Passover celebration of the Jewish people. So, there you go. That's very good one. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I didn't come for that, but I, I bet it was. It's, anything Seth does is always very well planned. Yeah. Always very well planned. Oh, go ahead. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No outsider shall eat it. But every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You, you shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Okay, and it, now it says here, you shall not break any of its bones. And I believe that that is specifically stated in the, uh, the gospel account. Um, it, what is it, uh, 19 or 20 where John, uh, let me see here. Uh, it, remember where they're going to... Uh, uh, okay, there it is right there. It says, um, then the soldiers came... Uh, We'll go back to 31. This is John 19, 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with them. But when he came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So uh, I, I, everybody here understands the symbolism of breaking the legs, why they did that. Do you, do, so that they couldn't support the weight anymore. That's right. Because when you're hanging like this and you can't push up, then you suffocate under your own weight. Your lungs can't breathe in anymore. So you die very quickly. But, you know, as long as they don't break your legs, you can continue to push up literally for days, I believe. I mean, depending on how badly you were punished before going to the cross. But they would, you know, Jesus obviously was beaten very badly because he died quickly. But, you know, they could push up with these nails in their feet and just breathe and then get exhausted and go back down and eventually they would just die of, of suffocation if they didn't die, die of blood loss first. But they, you know, the, the crucifixion, seeing how we're talking about the broken bones, 
if you ever want to read something that is just, I mean, it's brutal, but at least it let, gives you a perspective of what he went through. There are several doctors that have done an evaluation of the crucifixion and what it was like, the different things that happened to the human body. Well, and you can read it right online. Say, I did one in our church quite a few years ago. Oh, did you? Ron, have you ever heard of Ron Longden? He might be one of them that I've read. He's a neurosurgeon and a neurologist. Right. He did, this was at the old church years ago. He, he did a whole, like, Sunday morning on... What it was like. ...medical ramifications of the whole process of what he had, the Lord had to go through. Real, real brutal. And you can read it online. It's all put out there. Um, some of the sites are actually directed through Seventh-day Adventists. So you want to make sure that it's the same information... But, you know, one of them I used to have linked on my website, and somebody said, oh, well, that's linked to the Seventh-day Adventist. Well, to me, it was less important than what it said, because it's just an analysis of it. But I did find another one that I could link, because, you know, you just don't want to have somebody clicking on something else, something else, and ending up at a, uh, you know, a Mormon site, not Seventh-day Adventist, Mormon site. But, um, uh, y y you know, they, they specifically picked certain spots to drive the nails in that would go through nerves. And so there was... There wasn't just pain associated with something going through your body. There was continuous and agonizing pain, like having a pinched nerve or sciatica. Just imagine that, in addition to all the other pains that you're suffering. These Romans found the most brutal possible way to crucify people. And that is what Jesus went through. This wasn't something like, oh, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to, you know. He suffered as much as anybody could possibly suffer for us. So, and, and you know, I know it's hard to talk about those things, but at the same time, it's good to understand that this is the love that God has for us, that he would allow this to occur. Because this, in the end, is what we as human beings do deserve. We deserve what he got. And so we have a choice there. We can either accept what he did, or we can, you know, we can face a much worse destruction in the end, which is actually seeing the beauty of God and knowing that we will never behold it again. It, it, that thought alone is enough to just destroy somebody, in my opinion. You know? But if we're reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, then we can, we can see his beauty and we can enjoy it for eternity. So anyway, Passover lamb, none of his bones shall be broken. Um, all right, go ahead, 48. Uh, okay, when a stranger sojourns with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, said all his men... Let all his males be circumcised, and let them come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native in the land, for no uncircumcised people person shall eat it. Okay, this is explaining the previous verses that we read. It said here, um, no foreigner shall eat of it. Okay, a sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. And the reason why is because these people had not been circumcised. They were just people that were temporarily hanging around. They were not saying, identifying themselves with the covenant of Israel. Not but, Jews. well, even if they're not Jews, they could be a proselyte. And what he's saying in verse 48 is, it says, um, uh, where was it? if a stranger dwells with you, this is not a Jew. If he dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover, he must be cir circumcised. So some people say that that uh, what's his name uh, Cornelius was a proselyte. Okay, in other words, he wasn't a Jew. He was the, uh, the uh, head of the Italian regiment. But whether that's true or not. We have no idea. They just insert that because they want to say, well, these guys were circumcised. Some people say that Luke was a proselyte. In other words, he was not a Jew, but he was circumcised and he did all the things to be a part of the covenant people. That's what they're talking about here. If somebody doesn't go through those motions, then they cannot participate in the Passover. Okay? Like I said, if Cornelius and Luke were circumcised in the flesh, it makes no difference. No difference, because the fact is that they were circumcised in the heart. And this is pointing to that. It's, everybody must be circumcised. It's where is the circumcision. And Paul says, circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the heart. What's that, Romans 8 or 9 or something? Yes? Where, where did the, oh. the Nazarite vow come in? Nazarite vow is Numbers chapter 6. That is a temporary vow. Let's go there real quick, seeing as how you brought it out. Numbers chapter 6. I hope I'm right because I sounded like I knew what I was talking about there. Um, let's see here. Uh, numbers, I'm in 7. It always helps to get, yeah. Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Paul had a Nazarite vow. The book of Acts makes that clear. Remember when he went back to Jerusalem, shaved his hair, he was in the temple and he says, I got to keep the feast. And Okay. 
Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering made to the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, 